Hello, family. I'm Robert, and I'm a real alcoholic. Hey, Robert. Hey, Robert. I want to welcome everyone to the Lamb Step Up Society book study. Change your thinking, change your life. Let's open with a moment of silence, followed by the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer. Grant me serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. First of all, I want to give thanks and honor to people all over the world. You know, about every week we try to get down, you know, and we take out the computer and we look at all the statistics of the people who are watching the YouTubes and ordering the CDs. And I can honestly tell you, and I'm grateful and I'm honored, the people are watching this book study all over the world. All over the world. In every state. You know, right now I'm honored for Georgia is very high. Texas is high, and the third is New York. You know, and it kind of makes me laugh because my wife from New York, and then she, oh, New York, New York, New York, but New York is watching this Southern man. You know? <laughs> you know, they get down with it. They watching it. You know, and that, I'm honored for that. And then Australia, New Zealand, China, Thailand. Police. Where? Middle East. The Middle East, India. People are watching it all over the globe. So this study is making an impact on people's lives, and I'm honored for that. And I just want to tell the world, thank you. Thank you. But that was one of my visions, is to have a global book study. And it's, it's coming to manifestation. That makes sense? It's manifesting. All right, getting back to the study. We are finishing up step nine, making amends. Only thing I can tell you now is we've been on it for like three weeks. It's in the book. You get ready to make amends, it's in the book. Okay? I do suggest that you look for a spiritual experience every time you're doing your amends. Try to find something spiritual in it. Because the book says, suggests that that's what we do. All right, now we're at the promises. The promises, when we go to meetings and they read the promises, for a lot of newcomers, I didn't know when I first came in because the promises was read at every meeting. But I didn't know that the promises was at the end of step nine. I didn't know it was the end of step nine. And then when I started studying the book, I realized that the promises on page 83 is at the end of step nine. So when they say we'll uh, be a maid before we're halfway through, they're talking about halfway through the amends. Mm -hmm. Not halfway through recovery. They were talking about the amends. So with that, I think we can start there tonight. This is going to be a, a spiritual, more, more heading towards spirituality in a bigger way. You know, I was thinking of today, celebrate the 50th anniversary uh, the march on Washington with Dr. Martin Luther King and the freedom speech and I have a dream, the dream speech and I, I've been blessed to be being alive through the whole process. I was a kid and now it's 50 years later and they're celebrating and I'm, I'm here to witness that. But I think more than just being alive, my Freedom or my spirituality has changed for me. I understand Martin Luther King today on more of a spiritual liberation than it was flesh. Now, yes, they marched, we marched, and uh, we was coming out of trying to be segregated and coming out of that stuff and coming against being discriminated against and the whites and the black. That, that's fine. That was real. But now, with me, I understand Martin a little bit more on the vision side. He said, I have a dream. And when he was using his imagination, when he was using his, 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 his spirituality, you know, when he said, when he, even when he was talking about the promised land, I've seen the promised land. 
You know, he was using imagination. He was using spirit. For me, it's more spirit because I don't care what color you is. You can't hold me back. That's been broken. That, 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 that yoke is gone. I can't blame it on nobody. If it don't happen in my life, it's me. There's nobody can, can do that. So I have grown way beyond that. And that's kind of like these promises tonight. When I first read the promises, I wasn't where I am now. That makes sense? In my spiritual life. So that's the beauty of the thing. That's the beauty of, of, of working on yourself because you can evolve. You can grow. You know, I was looking at this picture and I was thinking, and I said, I don't want to think, I said, we might need to get rid of this. Then I took a second look at it. For what? <laughs> the plants evolved. There was a seed. You know, and they just evolved in the universe. There's no reason to get rid of this. Because this is what it is all about. So, I'm going to break this down with a little flavor of me in it, too. Now, if you're not where I'm at, it's okay. Just keep coming back. All right? You might not never be where I'm at. That's just me. God gave me me to be me, not to be you. He gave it for me. All right, we're going to start on, on page 83 at the bottom. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development. All right, Steve. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, you will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which use the battles. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. That's beautiful. Alright, let me let me break it down to the best of my ability. If we are painstaking. What does painstaking mean? I, you know, I had to look that word up. Careful. It means to be careful. Showing or involving great care and effect. I must be very careful or careful about this phase of my development. We'll be amazed before we're halfway through. I kind of mentioned that before. Halfway through the amends. When we're doing all these amends and we're seeing all these spiritual awakening, the amazement for me was that God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Every time I went into a situation to do a man and I was looking for a spiritual experience, I owed someone money and they gave me money. I go in a situation, I owe credit, uh, owe a credit card company, so, you know, that didn't pay the debt, then they gave me a loan, you know, I, 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 I bounced checks for my checking account, I had no money, just still writing, writing checks all over the place, the same bank that I bounced the check, give me an account, checking account, to me those are spiritual experiences. You know, so I was amazed. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. This, for me, was a turning point. When I start to realize that my happiness and freedom was an internal thing and stop trying to find happiness in outside stuff. Outside of myself, I've been looking for happiness all my life. If I get happy in the relationship, the relationship goes sour. And I'm unhappy. If I, if I find, I used to always think, if I just get that land, that good job, I'll be happy. 14 jobs down the line, I'm still looking for that happiness. If I just get a, if 
finish college, I'm going to live happily for the rest of my life. I was drunk at the college graduation. <laughs> you know? I always look for happiness outside of myself. This new happiness we're talking about now is internal. It's internal. You know, I'm going to pause and just talk about spirituality. For me, just as me, spiritual is for me to know that there is a part of me that is attached to the universal God, the creator, that's inside of me, and I have to say everyone else too. It's in everything. Today I'm aware of that. I'm aware. It say, be still and know that I'm God. I am aware of that. So I can watch today. I have trained myself how to watch my thoughts, my emotion, and my situations. I watch them. I don't have to join everything that comes across my mind. Every situation that comes across my mind, I don't have to get involved in it. Did that make any sense? I don't have to be a part of it. I can sit back and watch it. And don't have to fight it. You know, uh, like let's say payroll. I just use that as an example. You know you don't have enough money right now to pay anybody. Bye. Before, you know you don't have enough. I sure don't. What I need to do? What I need to do? What do I need to accomplish? What do I have to sell? What do I have to do? Just, it had control of me. I wasn't absorb, uh, observing it. I was not watching it. I became it. Then I started feeling sick. My emotions got in it. Then fear. See, when you do a four step, when you do a four step, there's a part in there about emotions. And they had you to write down the first emotion that come to you. Remember that? And then you add up the three, the, the, the emotion, the one in your lifetime, the, the, the first emotion, the second emotion, and the third emotion that you were more, well, I'm just going to say, more comfortable in. Because they showed up all the time. They were comfort, comfortable. Whether you always sad, always play the victim, always in anger, always disappointed. Whatever those three emotions was that you found on that paper when you did those checks in column three, they became comfortable for me. So in order to face the world, I allow the emotion to jump up and I jump into it to be comfortable. It's comfortable to be afraid. It's very comfortable to be angry with everybody. That makes sense? It's very comfortable to be pissed off because that's why I went on mostly any situation that happened in my life, I would jump into that emotion. Spiritual is when you don't have to jump into the emotion. You can sit back and just inhale, exhale, and let it disappear. You don't have to react to everything. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to be sad all the time. You don't have to be disappointed. You don't have to jump into those situations. You don't have to jump into that anger. You are the subject watching the object. That make any sense? You observing it. You don't have to play a part in it. That's spiritual. You know a person spiritual when they can maintain peace in the midst of a storm. You know, I watch Obama. You know, I watched him when uh, when they do was, was, it, was it him when they do the shoes. Bush, 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 Bush. Bush, Bush. He did it. They threw the shoes at him. Yeah. He flinch. 
Now me, I will pick the shoes up and throw them back. Or okay. have my security guard get them. You know what I mean? He has to do it. I watch Obama take those kind of verbal attacks. They just went by him. To me, that's more spiritual than somebody walking around with a big, thick Bible and a robe on, got the proper posture, and walking. <laughs> that's not spiritual to me. Spiritual is when you can maintain that peace. That makes sense. You are the one. You are the one that wear of what's going on around you. And you don't have to respond to it. But most people, most people are not like that. And the thought come across their mind, they have to do it. If you got a girlfriend or a boyfriend and they didn't answer the phone and you going to work, and you turn your car around to go check his apartment to see if anybody there? That's non-spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm bringing it up to AA now. <laughs> you, know, you don't have enough in you to watch that thought and just let it go. You start rationalizing. Am I going to be to work on time or not on time if I do this stupid move? And you do it. <laughs> and then you're going to go to the meeting and talk about how spiritual you are. Come on now. Spiritual, you don't really care. You maintain that inner happiness no matter who's over there. It don't disturb you. Are we getting the feeling of this thing? Somebody that tell you to do something wrong against your company. You don't do it. You maintain integrity for two dollars. A tip. Spiritual is to be able to have peace and happiness inside of you, no matter what the situation is. Alright? Try to tell you this is a spiritual program. Did I get there overnight? Unspiritually, wordly, you know, verbally, hell no. <laughs> it took time and practice and understanding. Because I never, in my 21 years claim, I never stopped studying and working on me. That's how you get there. I see people got nine months, they ain't picked up a book yet. <laughs> we are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. I think that's what a lot of people that marched today felt. They're not in the same freedom they were looking for 50 years ago. Now we got a spiritual freedom. I heard Martin Luther King's niece talk about that today. That we're not talking about the same kind of freedom for everybody that we were 50 years ago. We're talking about a spiritual liberation. We will not regret, regret the past nor wish to, wish to shut the door on it. I'm not going to regret my past. People call me today. I'm going to do an interview. I gave them all the past. I don't regret because I know what my life is. I know what my dharma is. I know what I had to go through in order to be where I'm at. It don't matter who know it. I know it. I showed it. I told it. And I can tell it again with no shame. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. Comprehend means you got it, right? Let's look up the word serenity in this AA dictionary. Calm, quiet, unruffled, peaceful. Peacefulness, peace of mind, at peace, dignity. Dignity. So here we are, we will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. They took the word serenity and they made it into a lifestyle. That makes sense? A behavior, a mindset, an emotion. It's not a word no more. It's a consciousness. It's a psyche. It's a way of being. It's a way of life. That makes sense? Can't nobody practice pure Peace. Unless, you know, unless you're on top of a mountain somewhere by yourself 
And then even then you're going to get mad that you're on top of the mountain. <laughs> but my thing is that you can't practice it. But for me, when I get out of it, I'm very uncomfortable now. You know what I'm trying to say? I have to quickly go into meditating, prayer, or making amends, or forgiveness. You understand what I'm saying? To get back into that serenity. And I think the more, for me, the more I practice serenity, seems like to me, more, the more God give me unserene people around me <laughs> to keep me serene. You know, if you practice peace, you're going to be some unpeaceful people real close to you and around you. That's miserable. But at the end of the day, it kind of keeps me in alignment. That makes sense? So this serenity and peace, you, it said we will know peace. You will know peace like you know your name. And if I say Calvin, and nobody look but Calvin, because Calvin know his name, when you got peace, that's how you know you have it. It's like you know your name. If every little thing that comes across your thought upsets you, or gets you pulled in, or can draw you in, it's kind of like a disturbance. To know peace will be, this is just me now, okay? This ain't everybody, this is just me. But there's a lot of people that's like me. If, you know, it's kind of like disturbance. If there's a disturbance, let me, let me see, let me see. If, if, we're all like looking, you know, to your right. Everybody looking to their right, and I did something like this. Made a disturbance. Whatever you were looking to your right, whatever you were thinking about to your right, this disturbance drew you to it. Imagine. Now, I made the noise, but imagine the noise is in your own mind. Every time a thought came by, it was a disturbance. You just be all over the place. That's unpeaceful. That means you do not have control of your mental faculties. You don't have it. You walk into Graham Street to the treatment center, you already messed up and you ain't got in there. <laughs> and the people in there, they sleep. Eating dinner, they ain't thinking about you. But you all messed up. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we see how our experience can benefit others. One night, you know, I know Jose, Jose William, remember him? Feed the Homer? His family, I sponsored one of his sons. And so I really didn't know Jose, I had met him and seen him a lot. You know, he was only down the street. I seen him over a hundred times, but I never really had a conversation with him. But he had a TV show that I used to watch. And I was new in recovery, and I was up about four in the morning. I remember this. And he was talking about this same thing. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we can see how our experience can benefit others. Now, Jose was unique. He wore overalls, boots, you know, trying to look at old phone. A lot of people didn't know he was a chemist. Yeah, he had a chemical company, plus he had a chemist degree. He's a smart, intelligent, genius. But his thing was, no matter how far down the scale we have gone, we can see how we can benefit up. And he was on that TV show, and he was saying that, like, drug addicts and people in recovery, that God gave us an opportunity to soak all the way down to the bottom of the, the barrel of people in society. And for the lucky few that come out, we can lower ourselves back down and help raise people back up to be productive members of society. That's how he kind of went to feed the hungry, you know what I'm saying, helping others. Because he understood that no matter how far down you go, you can still go down and come up and help someone else come up. You're not above it. 
It's all one. All right? So this, this thing that's aware of this, that's behind this, is spirit. That makes sense? That's watching every day. Some people in the yoga, they call it the Tao. Some people call it spirit. Some people, there's it's a lot of different names for it. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. Remember we're in the promises, y'all. We are in the promises. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. I hear self-pity, and I, by the grace of God, I'm thankful that I'm not in it no more. People a lot of times got self-pity. They don't know it, but it's there. Let's look up that word, self-pity. Pity for oneself. An unrestrained or excessive dwelling on one's sorrows or misfortunes. I hear it all the time. The economy really boosts up some self-pity. You have me. I ain't got no money. I can't, I can't do this, I can't do this. That's self-pity. You ain't got no money. Then you stop making money. Go find some money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what you're doing is excessive dwelling on your misfortune. That ain't going to give you fortune. All you're going to have is some more excessive talk about your Self-pity misfortune. <coughs> Change. Change your thinking. Change your life. It's like an alcohol a person coming into the fellowship talking about, boy, I, I sure. You know, they're talking about, I'm talking about five years clean, ten years clean. I ain't talking about no newcomer. If it wasn't for me drinking, I was uh, on the verge of being very successful. <laughs> he got five years clean. Still talking about, if it wasn't for me drinking all these years, I would been this, I would been that. Right or wrong? Right. Why don't you stop excessively sharing about that every meeting <laughs> and get up and be what you're supposed to be? Yeah. That excessive dwelling on your misfortune ain't bringing you nothing. The only doing make people do this. Because <laughs> ain't nobody trying to hear but someone else who like to talk like that. Ain't nobody listening. I love my God. They've been downhill ever since. When you lose your job? 2002. <laughs> They've been sharing about it. 2002. Nobody want to hear that. Get a new job. Or create a job. <laughs> They tell me about it. All I got is to step up. They told me the economy bad. I said, I wouldn't know. I ain't never looked. <laughs> Only thing I can tell you is I need them trucks to pull up in that back <laughs> and be able to pay my bill. I got my own economy. I don't need to worry about y'all hoes. Because everybody got their own. I don't care if you don't have a bank account. I don't care if you ain't got but $2 or you got $2 million. That's your own personal economy. Why are you worried about mine? Because I ain't worried about yours. I don't care tell you what the economy going to do. I ain't never looked. Don't care. I know if I got a hundred dollars in the bank, tomorrow it better be there. <laughs> That's my economy. <laughs> so, that self-pitying, man. Do that make any sense? That should leave. You got clean time, that should go. You don't need to be sitting around here complaining about your misfortunes. Nobody care. And the show ain't impressive. It is not. So we need to get up out of that. That's what the book say. I ain't saying it. The book say it will disappear. We will lose inches in selfish things and gain inches in our fellows. 
If you're only talking about your misfortune, you selfish, ain't you? Mm -hmm. You ain't thinking about nobody else. Mm -hmm. Somebody they called me selfish not too long ago. Because all I think about is recovery. I was telling people that earlier. You selfish. The only thing you think about is recovery. To me, just to just me, that's all it is. There's nothing on earth but recovery to me. I don't care if you're in AA or not in AA. You, if you're a human being, you're in recovery. You recover from something, whether it's cancer, sick minimum thoughts. If you lose a job, you go get a job, you're recovering. If your bill's behind, you start to pay them because you got a job, you're recovering. If you, you got a car out, your car is torn, broken, they got it in the shop, what is it being? Recovering. So you can get back on the road. You're recovering from some form or fashion. If you're a sinner, you go get baptized, you turn your life over to Christ, you're recovering. So I guess I am something that all the I'm talking about is recovery. Because that's all it is to me. There's nothing else. That's like saying this to me, there's nothing here but God. That's all I see. Nothing else. I ain't looking at your fault. I'm looking at the God in you. Because I believe it's in there. Because you sleep don't mean everybody sleep. A mm. whole attitude. No, self-seeking will slip away. A whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. Remember I told you you kind of stand back? If you got some fears, then practice it. You're afraid of something? Stand back and observe it. Just watch it. Inhale. Because when you're afraid, your, your chest tighten up. Y'all know that, right? I, mind you, around the heart. Relax. Take a deep breath. Let it out. And let it pass. And don't worry about it. Just let it be. Just sit, sit in the presence of spirit. And let it go. See what happens. I'm pretty sure if you do that enough, like I do, the fear will disappear and some kind of faith or solution will take its place. That makes sense? There's nothing to fear but fear itself. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. Remember I told you I used to be afraid of the IRS? Now they're my buddy. I'm always, you know, back and forth. But I'm not in fear no more. That's just a way of life for me. We will intuitively know how to sit, handle situations which used to baffle us. That intuitively means that automatically I can fix my problem. And I used to be all confused and scared and running and you know what I'm trying to say? Trying to figure out and calling people and acting like a fog eight. Now it just comes to me. I don't have to do all that. I don't have to do it. It just comes to me. I ain't got to call nobody no 50 times to check in. Right, Antonio? <laughs> I don't have to do that. I just intuitively they know I'm happy. No matter what they're doing, I'm going to maintain what? Happiness. My own. It ain't about them no more. It's about me. But if I'm happy, it might be contagious and they can become happy too. They might be happy without me. What they doing might make them happy. I'm just interfering out of that. Blocking it. Let them be happy and gone. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. The only reason, way you can realize that God is doing for you what you could not do for yourself is to pull back behind your thoughts, your problems, your emotions, and allow the spirit to fix it. That makes sense? Allow it to do it. 
your logic, remember you studied that? Your reasoning, your intellect, and all your senses couldn't fix anything anyway. At the end of the day, it never did any good because we sitting in here. The best thing is, you know, the best fixers, the best eyes, the best ears, the best taste, the best smell, the best touch is in here. We never fix them problems anyway. I was telling so I was telling the group of men that in in our in the Stepho Society, we did the math, it was like seven guys and we went about 25 years, right? Seven times 25 and what? Come on, math people. 175 years to live in our 175 years of insanity living in one of our houses. The 125 years of using. 175 years of insanity is in the house. You put all seven on clean time together, you might get two years. That's 123 years of experience in insanity and two years clean time. And they hoping everything gonna be okay. <laughs> this person making too much noise. What that person supposed to do? <laughs> huh? Say, I was 175 years and now what they're supposed to do? Be saints? The only way, the only way a house like that can operate without nobody killing each other is by the grace of God. No other way. No other way. Ain't nobody intimidate nobody. Ain't nobody cussing nobody out. It's just the grace of God. It ain't y'all. It's the grace of God. God doing for you what you couldn't do for yourself. Do the are, are these uh, extravagant promises? Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. All right. Are these extravagant promises? We always say we, we think not, right? Because you can see them happening to your life already, and you, if you haven't done the steps, and you're getting some of the rewards of the promises, imagine what might happen if you did do the steps. But I always tell people, listen to me closely, you're going to get the promises. You'll get the promises for doing recovery, or you'll get the promises and the relapses. It don't matter. You're going to get promised something. You're not going to go without promises. You will get promises. You leave us and go you, you get some promises. They waiting on you. Stay in here and do the work, you get some promises. It's waiting on you. The choice is yours. All right, this talk. No, it says, this is important. They are being fulfilled feel among us sometimes quickly sometimes slowly remember quickly we're talking about a spiritual experience slowly we're talking about spiritual awakenings we're not talking about so uh, I'm gonna get in a quick relationship or a slow relationship unless it's with God we're talking about spiritual experiences versus spiritual awakening if you don't believe it, go to the appendixes in the back and read spiritual experiences. It'll explain it to you. They will always materialize if we work for them. Everything in the spiritual world, the unseen world, the world where the observer watches, has no choice but to manifest. There's nothing on the planet, no water, no shoes, no socks, no cars, no airplanes, no cell phone, no watches, no houses, no lumber, no nothing came here that did not burst dark in the invisible, in the human imagination. Everything was imagined 
birth before it became an object in the world. That you can't name one thing showed up that wasn't in the human imagination first. Even the Bible says it was void and nothing was here. Now, even the scientists say the Big Bang <laughs> started the whole universe started less than a pea. From nothingness, boom. I told y'all this is a spiritual program. Ten step. This brings us to the temp, step ten, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we clear <coughs> up the path. We have entered the world of the spirit. Our next box. Say that is, again. We have entered the world of the spirit. Bam! Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. All right. This thought brings us to step 10. Let's take a minute and talk about step 10. Basically, step 10 is doing a 4 through 9. A 4 step through 9. Let's say I had a, uh, me and James had a big argument or something like that. And I cursed him out or he cursed me out. And by me being a 12-stepper, I feel bad about that. Remember, I have broken... My uh, my alignment with spirit. Okay, I was drawn in by some type of disturbance that crossed my mind, and I reacted to that. Am I right? And that's what we've been talking about. Some thought I could have walked away, but some thought crossed my mind. Get yeah, that my mind. <laughs> it was a disturbance, and I jumped into that. It sucked me in emotionally. I turned, came toward him, and we got into a confrontation. All right? That's how it worked. Now, where it took instantly or two days later, it's the same process. If it was two days later, I probably was clinging on, building up the mellow drama in my head. I can't wait to see him so I can cuss his ass out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Weekend. I've been playing with this. Now, they know what kind of control do I have? What kind of spirit do I have if I'm doing that? All weekend I'm holding that kind of resentment and clinging to it. Then I see it, bam. Now I'm out of alignment, but I was out of alignment the whole weekend anyway. Alright? So it says, then I do a four step. <coughs> Made a certain inventory of myself. I need to look at what part I played in. Well, I, I shouldn't have took his money like that. You know, I shouldn't have lied about this. Uh, whatever I did, I had to look at what part I played. Then I, what I need to do is I got to do a four through nine so quickly I get on the phone. And I, I know how to do this because I had a long, you know, I did the long form. Now I'm doing the short form. So I called up Ron and said, look, Ron, I got a bad thing with Jay, man. But I'm going to tell you what part I played. I do a fifth step for him, God, and another person. Six step, I had God in removing. Seven step, have it removed. Eight, I already got it. eight, because I know what I injured. Oh, if it's anybody else, I know it's him. And I go over and you meet Jane, face to face, and I make amends. That's a ten step. That makes sense? That's a ten step. Now, once you start doing ten step, you really going to see how crazy you are. Because you see yourself doing 10 steps all day long. I was doing 10 steps all the time. I said, something wrong. It's not the fact that I know how to do 10 steps. It's me. Something's wrong with me. Then I got to go around apologizing all the time. I need to change me. That means I'm unspiritual. You know what I'm trying to say? I was able to see myself always doing 10 steps. That wasn't comfortable. 
I was fighting trying to have a decent life by doing 10 steps all the time. That's uncomfortable. I'm not free. I'm always making apologies. <laughs> Telling God I'm sorry. Take it away and then the next day, bam, I'm doing the same thing. That's uncomfortable. I'm not free. And I'm not happy. That's what the, the best thing about a 10 step. It shows you how messed up you are. That's what I got out of it. I got sick and tired of doing 10 steps. Sick and tired of calling people and making apologies. But I was really doing the work, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't trying to run from this, though. I was really doing the work. I got sick and tired of apologizing. So I had to do some more work on me. All right? So I said, this thought brings us to step 10, which su suggests we continue to take personal inventory. That's step four, right? It says, and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. Making amends. We vigorously commit this way of living as we clean up the past. House cleaning steps. Go do not. Get it. Is. We have entered the world of the spirit. Remember I told you the world of the spirit? But you behind the stuff. Now you don't got a taste. I got a taste of the world of the spirit. The peace, the happiness that's inside of me and the freedom. And I'm always jumping out of it. And then I have to go back like a accordion. In and out. In and out. In and out. That's frustrating. Say that to me. I'll bet all when I be just out. Just out. Just be out. Just in and out stuff ain't working. That makes sense? I done tasted spirit and I'm going in and out. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's uncomfortable. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. I got to improve, y'all. I got to grow. I got to understand more. And I have to be more effective. That's when I kind of like start reading other books. You know what I'm trying to say? Like the spirits start giving me Deepak Chopper, Wayne Dyer, you know, other spiritual people. Church made more sense. The Bible made more sense. I start growing. You know, I kind of start listening more and paying more attention to my behavior and things in me. Now, there's no way you're going to be perfect. But you can grow. In recovery, there's a thing, and a lot of people with a lot of years have this, and I, I think I mentioned it before, about being sober but stuck. Sober but stuck. Ten years clean, sober and stuck. Still helping other people, but they life a mess. Got sponsored, going to meetings, but your life a mess. I was there. I was so sick, and nobody had told me about sober but stuck. Nobody had never mentioned that to me. I went back, I, I sat in my office, and my life was a mess. And I was doing book studies and counseling folks. You know what I'm saying? Taking people through the steps. But my life was a mess. I was depressed. I, you know, all kind of stuff was going on. But I didn't pick up. I called over to St. Jude, the place where I went to treatment, and said, help! They told me, come over. And they explained it to me. The counselors over there explained to me about Sober But Stuck. And ordered a book for me. It's a book called Sober But Stuck. And I read the book. And took their suggestions. And got help. When we saw a psychologist, not a you know, psychologist, got help and became unstuck. But there is a position called Sober But Stuck. And I tell people that. You might not hear that in a lot of meetings. You know? But it's a position. Alright. So I, I had to, our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. Remember I told y'all I've been doing it for 20 some years. Studying and reading and uh, practicing and trying different techniques and yoga and meditating and running and I done tried everything. But the best thing is to sit still and learn to watch your thoughts. Don't fight them. 
let them go. And your emotions. This is not an overnight matter. It's to continue for our lifetime. We in it to win it. Who say that? I heard that a lot. Oh, uh, American Idol? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, Randy Jackson? Jackson? You in it to win it! That's what I'm talking about, dog. You in it to win it. <laughs> Listen to this. Listen to this. I told you the book was deep. Did I not tell y'all that? If you read it for faith value, you ain't getting much. Continue to watch. Continue to watch. Who is watching? Who is the one in you that's watching for well, what they say? Self -self. Selfishness. Who is watching for dishonesty? Who is watching for resentment? And who is watching to fear? See, if you in selfishness, you can't be watching it. Selfishness cannot watch selfishness. Resentment can't watch resentment. But the two are the same. That makes sense? Fear don't watch fear. Who is it that watches that? There's something in you, the subjective you, that watches this stuff. Now, if you're watching it, it didn't tell you to jump into it. It said, watch it. Look at it. Be aware of it. Observe it. The spiritual self in you, with the capital S, S, or the God in you, or the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, the Tao, whatever it is, is the silent one that watches this stuff. If you're always into this stuff, trust me, you're not watching it. You're a part of it. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to watch it. That takes practice. They say it's going to be a lifetime. It's not an overnight matter. But somebody got to tell you. I have to practice it. I work with my wife. You don't think I have to watch it? <laughs> oh, she got to watch it? You know what I'm trying to say? People have accidents in the trucks. They, before they pick up the phone, they want to create a lie. Right, kid? They tell you about the lie. Because <laughs> they think I'm going to act like a park eight. But I have to watch it. Me acting like a park gate ain't gonna change the situation that's already occurred. Right, right. Yeah. All you can do is put gas on the fire mm -hmm. and make it worse. We got to watch it. When these crop up, if you're watching it, you'll see it crop up in you. They're not talking about reacting to this stuff. They're talking about watching it, and when it crop up, we add God at once to remove them. And I'm sitting here and I done learned the practice of watching my fears. You know, you really got, ain't, but, ain't that many. Remember you did the three? When you're sad, uh, angry, or frustrated, you know, for the fourth step, you watch it when they come up. Insecure, that's a big one. Insecure. When you're insecure, or you complaining all the time, you know what I'm trying to say? You know, you, you know what they are in you, and I know what they are in me. And when I see it happening, and I watch it crop up, I can say, God, I don't want it. Let it go. That's spirit. Now y'all know what it is, right? It ain't because you put no tide in, you know, the, in the dang weekly. Trust me. You put tired of them and have a resentment and put tired some more. But your ass don't have resentment when you come up out of there. Because you ain't watching. You're not the, the subject. You are the object. The subject and object. Spirit and unspirit. Invisible and visible. You can name it whatever you want to. It's the same principle all over the world. It's inside you. In your mind. Ain't talking about looking in your heart, in your blood, in your stomach.
coming inside your psyche. That makes sense? You can watch the melodrama take place. You don't have to react to it, you can watch it. Let it go. You know, we got a saying up here, when you work upstairs, I got, I got a couple new people, I know Steve know it and Wayne know it. We have a customer that complain all the time. They complain all the time, but they ain't come pick up my donation, and it was so nice, and this and that. The driver done already called and said, it was garbage, trash. <laughs> Take a picture of it, send it to you. Big, big old, you know, on the internet. There it is, big old rag of that sofa with a cat done tore up. You can see the little cat heated up under it, and smiling. <laughs> you know? They tell you how good it is, right? <laughs> and they complaining. We got a little saying where we say, we put the complaint in a boat. You know, you know how you see on the, on the like a pond, and the little boat that's tied up to the little wooden dock? We put the complaint in the, in the, the boat, and we kick it. And let the boat go on down the street. <laughs> Never to return, it float away. The people, we don't call them back, we don't do nothing. We just let the problem float. We don't have to respond to every day. They knew when they put that sofa out there that it was garbage. They were hoping that we come and pick up their garbage so they don't have to call 1-800-DRUNK-REMOVAL, whatever it is, or pay somebody. They knew it. So we don't have to respond to everyone. You know what I'm trying to say? I had guys up here that I had to let go because they want to respond to everything. Look, didn't we tell you not to call the lady back? <laughs> Oh, I just, that is my right to call back. Well, your right is the right to leave. <laughs> you got a right, but it ain't going to be in here. But we don't respond to every problem. That makes sense? Because it's not our problem. That sofa was your problem. You want to make it out. <laughs> we discuss this with someone immediately, and we make amends quickly. If we have harmed anyone, step four through nine. That's a step ten. Y'all got it? Mm -hmm. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. You always got to be helping someone. Love and tolerance of others is our code. Uh, and I think we um, should probably should start here tonight. And then next week we'll finish up on the spiritual side of the program because what's happening is we do have a spiritual program. A spiritual program of action. And it's deep. I hope I'm explaining it to the world to the best of my ability. Now, it's deep. It's not no, nothing shadow about the 12 steps. I want to give everybody a picture to let you know that these are things that we have to do. You, you know what I'm trying to say? You can go to a meeting and they can tell you, yeah, we got a 10 step. They never tell you what it is, how to do it. We talk about the spiritual program all the time, but nobody tell you what spirit is. You know what I'm saying? How you can become spirit. You know, spirit is in everyone. You know, it recently, it's been a few years since I really discovered what it was. But I was on the path looking. You know what I'm trying to say? I had to read. There's some good books on it. It don't mean that you're not going to be human. It don't mean that. It don't mean that your past is more spiritual than you either. Because he can quote a few scriptures and get up there and tell you a story. You don't know what's going on when the, the door is closed. You know, it's a business. You know, we can have nice fresh carpet, nice air blowing, pretty chair, and a nice big pew of milk. Everybody bring me $100 every week. Every Wednesday, bring me $100. dollars would be clean. Beautiful. I can do that. That is a business. We're not talking about a business here. We're talking about how to get past them thoughts that keep you sick and them emotions that keep you sick. You can't take a seat behind that stuff. And now, wouldn't your life be better if you can be aware of it and stop joining it all the time? Stop being disturbed by every little action that you hear? You know, you're sitting in a movie. It's kind of like you're sitting in a movie. And you're watching TV on a movie, and the movie's so good, you become a part of it. You're not even aware that you're in the seat in the theater no more. <laughs> You're a part of the movie. Until somebody slap a baby upside the head or some other cell phone ring, you know, like, oh, I'm in the theater. You were sucked in into the movie. Spirituality is not being sucked in. It'll be able to sit back and watch it. 
and be aware of what's in you instead of being a part of the movement. Thank y'all for coming.